Well, uh, good morning. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, tradition already, I would say, namely these um, performance days organized by, by, um, by our colleague uh, Zelia Tuek and, and Anna, Anna Teles. It's a wonderful project. Uh, we remember last time in Paris, in Hungarian Centre, we had this absolutely remarkable symposium, and then now we are in, in Portugal, Evora. So it's great to be here and, um, and wish uh, all the success for this project. The top, I go to my topics, uh, but maybe um, I must explain a little bit its background first. Uh, you see, it is a, pro a proposal for a semiotic theory of performing arts. So, in fact, this is a quite new text, which I've just completed. It's rather long, it's 31 pages, so I, I have no intention to read it <laughs> to you, but, but it's the background of my speech here. So I try to develop a, a general theory of performing arts. Uh, of course, uh, music uh, plays a very central role there, but, but also other performing arts like cinema, film, and, and theater, and recite and ballet, and others. So um, that's some uh, text which I have uh, in French already. It will be pub um, published in, uh, in Brussels, Brussels. There was a symposium last spring by my colleague André Elbo from Theater Sciences about performing arts in, in Brussels, and it will appear in its proceedings. So. Uh, and in Finnish, I have uh, one version of it which is complete with the pictures. But I shall utilize that for the diagrams here, because otherwise they are not quite visible. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I have an, an other text, which is also very fresh. <laughs> I finished it this year, not yet published at all, but it is maybe more interesting for you, because about music, it about, it's about one particular piece of music, maybe uh, Fantasy in C Major, Opus 17 by Robert Schumann. And it is also a very, very long text, I'm sorry, <laughs> I write a long text, and it's very new. And there I apply a little bit the same methodology which I'm proposing uh, for, for the, this, so that perhaps I could illustrate uh, for this audience and this occasion uh, uh, Schumann example a little bit to make it more concrete, so that it's not only pure theory. Well, but uh, um, uh, to introduce my topics, um, uh, certainly I have here a term uh, semiotics, which may, may be rather frightening to, for, to some of you. It's something uh, no longer new, but anyway, in, in, for musicians, uh, it may be something rather, rather fresh. Uh, maybe you have not been in touch with this new discipline, the study of signs and significations and communications, semiotics. And um, uh, in, in musical semiotics, uh, we are doing a lot of things, and that is one of my very special fields. But um, semiotics, if you put it very simply, what it is, uh, could be said like Umberto Eco, that it is um, study of signification plus communication. And certainly this touches performing arts, because in performing arts we are certainly most often dealing with certain kind of text which is there before we perform a kind of sign complex, I would say, and then this text is made manifest by performance in, in some form. So it is, it is communicated, let's say so. So there are first significations, and then it is communicated to the, to the audience. However, we know there are some cases um, like improvisation. We shall hear later about improvisation, certainly, which is a very fascinating case in which you don't have a text before, but it is just emerging uh, right there on the stage. So it's very challenging to study even that semiotically, and um, we shall hear later about that. But um, in semiotic theory, you know, there are many schools. There is the, the Paris School of Semiotics based on Gramas theory, very strong, uh, especially in, in Italy and um, Spain and, and Latin America, uh, the Paris School. But then there is, uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> other schools as well, like uh, we have the um, per Charles Sanders Peirce School, uh, stemming from the uh, United States. Uh, we have the um, uh, Tartu Moscow School of uh, cult Culture Semiotics, one branch. We have Cognitive Semiotics. And um, as to myself, I've uh, tried to develop a, a new theory which I call Existential Semiotics. So what is Existential Semiotics? It may be sound rather cryptic to some of you, but uh, certainly the term Existential evokes something to all of you. Um, I remember I, my first book appeared at Indiana University Press um, Bloomington uh, in the year 2000, uh, entitled Just Existential Semiotics. And my publisher, John Gorman, asked me, what is the existential after all? Is it existential life, he said. 
Well, I think as an American, he certainly thought something like the, the transcendentalists of American philosophy, like uh, Emerson and, uh, and uh, Thoreau, uh, Adi Thoreau, Walden, so let's say existential life in the forests, for instance. But certainly, and then in the European scene, existential evokes existentialism, of course. Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and, and these uh, great scholars. And if you go in philosophy uh, further back in history, uh, existential philosophy is stemming from Hegel, of course, and Hegel reversed by Søren Kierkegaard in Denmark, you know, and then later uh, Heidegger, Jaspers, uh, and then in, in uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, Hannah Arendt student of, um, of uh, Heidegger and Jaspers both, and then in France, uh, as I said, Sartre, and, and also in, in, in the arts, existential appears, you know, um, in Albert Camus and Sartre as writer, and, and also in paintings and, and so. So that's the background, but um, my new theory, with, which I try to launch, is not a, any return to anything which was before, but it's rather rereading the classics, uh, because I found, I think they ex uh, discover something exciting to tell us. And um, if I recombine this, uh, mostly German-based, rather speculative philosophical uh, theory of exist existential issues and modern semiotics, we get a totally new combination. And that is my, uh, the essence of my theory. I'm more interested in science becoming science. So uh, no longer, I would say, fixed science. Normally we think that semiotics is dealing with some uh, rather apparent science, like, let's say, uh, traffic science or, or or stamps, or, or, or military signals, or, 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 or advertising, or clothes, which are very, very obvious. But uh, more exciting are the states before the, the fixed sign emerges, so science becoming science. So I study rather processes of, and the life of the science. And certainly, this is close to performing arts, because in performance, we are also moving. We are, we are, we are, it's dynamic, it is processual, rather than, than fixed with anything definite. Uh, so that is the, the background and the, um, uh, the model to which I, which I want to show now to you um, about this here, because maybe, maybe in my text I have some general remarks first about performance in general. So I have some points, uh, I think that is rather invisible, it's so small, I'm terribly sorry, it's not PowerPoint, but um, anyway, I have the categories of performance, like um, skill, so certainly, performance is based upon certain skills. You have, like we say in linguistics, we have competence and performance, competence and performance. So there are certain skills without which you cannot perform anything. And of course, the, the, with skills, there are many interesting psychological uh, um, problems, like the, the tensions. So how, how you, when you perform, you are certainly tensed, because what you do is very significant, and you, you may be scared of what, what you are doing. That's a problem for any, any performer. You can never be sure whether, whether, whether you succeed or not, because it's a physical process, indeed. Skill. Um, theory. Uh, some think that there might be a theory of performance. Let me show you one example which is, um, comes from uh, theater sciences by my colleague from uh, Finland who applied Grema School for, for um, actors' work on stage. Uh, and um, uh, this is a very typical structuralist model. This is very typical of the whole this approach that you, you build such model, models whereby you try to portray. This is uh, about... Um, um, uh, from the um, uh, comedy by Carlo Goldoni, Il Baruffe, uh, uh, written in 1763, I think like that. It's a dialogue between two, uh, two actors, Isidoro and Cecca, on, on stage. It, uh, the whole thick study by my colleague, Professor Salazar, is uh, about five minutes uh, acted uh, um, theater performance, as video performance. And you see there in this model that uh, what happens, there are two, two protagonists, namely there is Isidoro, and Cecca. And in these boxes, all right, you can see. In these boxes, uh, uh, this in, uh, you see that they, they say something, and then uh, you see these arrows portray that the, how they react to each other all the time. And um, what is um, uh, exciting are these um, tiny modal, modalizations or modalities, uh, which was innovation of Grammar to say music. You know, vouloir, savoir, pouvoir, uh, croire, etc. They are ability uh, V, P, non-P, etc. So that all the time these modalities intervene in this. 
No, you should know Gray mass theory to know, but, but that is the, the problem. But now, the most exciting here is that on, if you have two actors on stage, and if one says or does something, and the other is silent, albeit here, she is silent, she is there, she remains there. And now, if we go to music, it's totally analogous. I have here an example of the... Oh, I like this, okay. Let me give you something like... <laughs> very familiar, you know this. Of course. <laughs> Anyway, so maybe so it is the same as in, in the in the drama, so Texture is often very dramatic, so it's, it's uh, like Mozart, especially. Uh, Mozart puts his, his opera ideas on, on totally absolute musical pieces. So, well, uh, we might uh, now ask that whether it's um, possible to, to uh, be, uh, make a theory of performance. And uh, some people say that it's yes, some people say no. <laughs> um, there are many um, competing theories in that. Then my third category uh, is time. Certainly, performing is always temporal activity. It, it takes place in uh, there are temporal strategies. I have an American colleague, Alexander Pierce, who developed in California a theory of expressive or generous movement using, using this, this idea uh, of, of uh, time. And um, in art music, you know, uh, it, it's an um, important uh, strategy, let's say, Sergei Rachmaninoff always plan his work so that the climax is, was very, very exactly calculated in a certain temporal moment of the piece. So that was uh, uh, in his mind. And you know, Sersku Zewitsky, the famous Russian uh, conductor in Boston Symphony Orchestra, um, he, <laughs> it's crazy, but when he started, um, he never gave a sign when it starts. He raised his hands up and then they uh, descended and the musicians should, should know in which moment they should start to play. <laughs> So this, this made them very, very uh, alert and, and very attentive uh, for the performance. So uh, temporality is certainly uh, very important. Um, we had the interesting theories on temporality by John Rink uh, last time in Paris, I remember, uh, of temporal strategies in examples. But um, that is very problematic. And um, I give another example uh, from the topics which I study right now, namely Richard Wagner. You know, when Richard Wagner conducted his um, operas in Bayreuth himself. He, he never fixed to one interpretation. He always changed it, even, even during one day, so that no one could know, know exactly what he wanted. And, and um, we had two uh, eyewitnesses, namely Heinrich Borges and, and um, uh, Mr. Fricke, who, Richard Richard Fricke. One was ballet master, other was music critic. They wrote that, um, about Wagner, that um, working with Wagner is extremely difficult. As he does not stick to one thing for long, he jumps from one subject to another. You can't pin him down for one subject, which could immediately find a solution. Um, I may say he lacks all it takes, for his mind is focused on the entirety, losing sight of details and forgetting how he had wanted things done the day before. So you know that was to, that's why it was totally crazy when uh, after Richard uh, Cosima wanted to keep it as it was in Richard's time because there was no such thing like, like Richard's authentic interpretation. He himself was all the time changing it. So it was illusion. So I mean that um, everything in especially music is under time and uh, te temporality and its varieties. Then my fourth category in this um, introduction to the real theory is our emotions. Certainly, we are doing with emotions when we interpret or play. Although we had, uh, you know, this um, Vladimir Jankelevich speaks of expressive or inexpressive, this new category of aesthetics in the 20th century music, Stravinsky and Prokofiev, so some kind of emotionless, uh, emotionless uh, expressivity, but it's only the minus side, I would say, of the primary uh, emotionality. Of, and emotions, certainly, we can study by Gray Massian modalities if you want. Fifth category is the 
intentional body. So musician, when he enters on stage, is no longer in his physical body. He enters the intentional body, which is a totally different thing. Marcel Proust portrayed this wonderfully. You may read uh, from Marcel Proust um, than La Prisonnière, this wonderful uh, this description of the concert at Madame Verdurin, where they performed the Septuor by Van Teuil, fictive composer. And how he put, he, Proust portrays the musicians' work, how they, um, they are no longer in their real body, but they are in the intentional body, which is totally different. And I think this theory is reasonable, because how else could you understand, let's say, function of a symphony orchestra? It's certainly unbearable if you think that you close 100 persons on, on the same space for, for, let's say, five hours, and they have to be exactly there and even do the same movements under the very, very strict control of the conductor. It is impossible to think um, it's worse than in the so-called uh, office of the, you say, landscape office where you have the typewriter sitting there. <laughs> so, because because um, uh, it's worse because um, uh, they are so close to each other. Well, it's possible because musicians, they are in their intentional body. They forget their physical body for the performance and they focus in music. So, and then this uh, intentionality is linked with um, one further notion which, to which I return in my own theory, namely the gesture gesture, which certainly is important in all the performing arts. Um, in musicology and musical semiotics, it has been recently launched by my colleague Robert Hatton from uh, America, this theory of gestures, but um, I don't go to details here. And then my um, two last categories, so one is unpredictability. Unpredictability. You never know what happens on stage before. And in this sense, it comes close to uh, Mihail Bakhtin's idea of the dialogue, because uh, the result of a dialogue is always unpredictable. When you have two subjects uh, in communication, you never know who is the other one and how he reacts and what happens. So that's why uh, also the performance is unpredictable. And the last category, uh, which is very important, is um, in German, shine. Shine in German. It means, um, comes from erschein, so to appear. It's the appearance. So performance belongs to the uh, reality of appearance. So it's not the being, it's appearance. Paretre uh, in, in, in French, l'apparenza in Italian. And, and uh, that is, uh, uh, there is a whole philosophical theory from Immanuel Kant of, of Schein and Friedrich Schiller, of course. And it's, it's also semiotically relevant because I distinguish in my own theories uh, two kinds of appearance. One is um, um, vertical, let's say, any sign uh, is appearance of, of signified the content in, in this upright movement. But then on the other hand, there is a vertical appearance. So uh, we with temporality. So you play something, you can play only one note, one after the each other. So there is a horizontal, horizontal line of appearance, uh, which is philosophically extremely important. Well, these were my just um, tentative um, general remarks. But now let's take uh, quickly by my, my model uh, of existential semiotics. And um, I try to take it from my study from, of Schumann, because there it's, it's already applied to music. I go back to my other text now. So, have a look. Uh, there are in, in four categories. Uh, they are put uh, in, in three different languages. They are in English, French, and German. I'm sorry, there is still one mistake. It should be an mir sein, not an mich sein, an mir sein, but otherwise it's, it's right. <coughs> and of course, this <coughs> uh, German language uh, terminology comes from Hegel, his philosophy. An sich sein und für sich sein are for, from Wissenschaft der Logik by Hegel. An sich sein means the thing in itself, like in Kant, das Ding an sich. So things are uh, as something as, as they are. But then für sich sein means that this... Uh, thing, let's say, person, performer, enters into some kind of uh, uh, context and social relations, and he, he is determined by others. He becomes für sich sein. But then I add here uh, an, an other category, namely moi and soi, in French, from French philosophy. Moi means me, me, as subject, ego. And soi means the society. And then I get uh, these four categories, namely being in myself, being for myself, and then being for itself, and being itself, so that moi is up and soi is down. Um, 
And these uh, four cases, they correspond to the gray massia modalities of will, can, know, and must. So, vouloir, pouvoir, savoir, and devoir, you know. This is very, very abstract. Let's go to music. <laughs> in music, being in myself is the primary kinetic energy, core, gestuality, the bo simply said the body in music, the corporeality music. Music is always something uh, corporeal. There is always this uh, primary, uh, totally physical, uh, often chaotic uh, first appearance of music. I call it, it, uh, it is this case. But then, uh, this primary chaotic um, physical aspect becomes, via education, a, a, an identity and personality. Uh, 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 it adopts certain kinetic forms and modality of can. On the other hand, we have here down in the corner of the, on the down um, right, we have the sua, we have the being in itself, we have, um, we have um, topics, norms, forms as abstract virtual categories norms and values of, of society, must. And then we have uh, low on, on the left side, we have the exemplification of these um, norms and values uh, as individual solutions, applications and strategies of a composer. We have, let's say, uh, topics, gestures, rhetorics as, as just um, social practices. And so we have, um, you may also uh, read a text. In next phase, we get to next my so I simply uh, call these by numbers moa one, moa two, m one, m two, and sua one, sua two, s one, s two, to make it more simpler in my later analysis. And as you can see <coughs> here again, so moa one is, I repeat, primary kinetic energy, desire, gestuality, core, body. Moa two is identity, personality, habit, stability, and S2 are social roles, institutions, practices, and S1 are norms, values, and general codes. And so I would say that we have two semiotic forces in, in this model. One is stemming from the body, from moa towards the sua. So body, so to say, is sublimated gradually. It's, it becomes personality, it becomes certain role, musicians say, and then it portrays certain aesthetic values, S1. That is one movement in this Z model, I call it. And the other movement is from the society, Sua. I mean the, the abstract aesthetic values, let's say the beauty in S1, gradually uh, becomes um, corporeal and more, more practical. Uh, if you have the beauty, then you may have a conservatory in S2 as a social role and, and a musician. And then conservatories, they recruit certain personalities who are uh, apt to, they become M2, you see, up. M2s and M2s, this uh, person, they must have certain physical uh, physical qualities. Let's say, if you want to become a singer, you must have good lungs. If you want to be a pianist, my fingers. If you want to be a uh, um, wind instrument, you must have good teeth, <laughs> mouth, etc. You must have certain totally physical qualities in M1. Uh, and um, ultimately, I say that these four cases, they are. This is ontological because I think that um, uh, this portrays also the. Uh, what I call le monde, le monde naturel, the, uh, which is uh, the real world. And um, I make a, I apply this to Schumann. Um, for instance, I mentioned here a case of, let's say, Aufschwung. Schumann Aufschwung, the piano piece. M1, it's kinetic volatile energy. M2, um, no, S2, uh, M1 is uh, it's, uh, energy. M2 would be that there are certain themes, and then certainly uh, S2 would be, it is a character, it has a certain genre, character piece, and then S1 is its aesthetic value. And this model I, I try to apply now to Schumann fantasy. Um, and uh, we can also make a kind of for analysis to apply this. Uh, this we can see that these, these are like levels which are superimposed in the musical, so they appear simultaneously. So when you listen to this Schumann fantasy, you certainly, you, you perceive everything at, at once, simultaneously. Body, per actors, uh, um, genre, they are all, all in the same, but you can, in analysis, they are distinguish them. And to, to study, let's say, M1, uh, I <laughs> gestures, primary morality in this piece, I indicate, I invented my own <laughs> notation, which I put, let's say, you are movements for wars. 
arrow like this. Then you have movements, primary movements for worse, but then something going to the other direction, you see the second sign. Then movements backwards, uh, and so. Then uh, syn syncopations in rhythmically. Then uh, movement up, movement down, uh, fermata, accelerando, ritardando, so, um, all right. That would be M1 level. M2 level, we distinguish actors or thematic units. That is more traditional. You A, B, A prime, etc. You have the musical form like musical themes and actors. Then uh, S2, now you have certain genre features, musical form. Uh, you may think it's, it's a sonata form, so you may have their exposition, development, recapitulation. Then you may have topics like learn, gallant style. You may have rhetorical figures, let's say, like ellipses, which he really uses there. So that is the level of S2, social practices of music. And then ultimately in this piece, you have the S1 aesthetics. You have this famous Einleiser tone by Schlegel. You have the myth, the idea of fragments, ruins, Faust, arabesque. So you, you have such thing. Let me a little bit, little bit show you how this would be. So that... Um, um, because um, this piece indeed, uh, oh, maybe I, I show you, I put the example here. Um, namely, if you like to use so-called generative models, which were fashionable in the 1980s, uh, no longer so much, you can think that a uh, musical work is like this. This is quoted from uh, Yuri Lotman and other, the start of Moscow school, namely that you have the levels of, like in the, any text whatsoever has phonetic, metric, syntactic, semantic, and symbolic levels which are superimposed, you know. And there is principle of semantic gesture which is going through these levels making the piece uh, coherent. Semantic gesture was used by, by Prague structures, but uh, Roman Jakobson uh, used the term dominant quoting for the musical terms. So dominant is principle, which is just making it coherent. Now you can, if you like, you can uh, reorganize my levels of M1, M2, etc., in, in, in a kind of generative grammar so that you have these levels like this. M1 is body, lowest, then identity, then M2, M3. Now, uh, I must thank you say that uh, time passes and theories change. <laughs> I don't believe any longer this kind of um, organic uh, process which, which would uh, be just uh, level by level, like, like, like in Gremas, uh, like in Heidegger philosophy as well. I don't think that, that let's say, uh, these phenomena are, are emerging organically from the deep structure, which is lowest there. Rather, what happens is the next one, I must go to the next page, namely there are conflicts between these levels, uh, like this. Rather, this is the, the reality. I mean that composer can make something on the body level which is in clash with norms and values. Suddenly, the, he puts something which is um, totally physical, which, which, which breaks, the, let's say, the norms. Or um, he do, does something as uh, on the level of M2, he's um, on the level of personality, which is uh, against the genres for instance, or, practice, or, or topics or, or musical forms. So there are clashes all the time, on, and, and this, this makes it very, very interesting to follow the, uh, the um, emergence of musical signification. Let us see how this uh, functions in Schumann, and uh, let me try to get this uh, piece, the beginning of it at least, visible to you. I have it. No, it's not there. Uh, maybe it's the guilty. Yes, here it is. Okay, we all, all, all know that. But it's good to see the first page to, to refresh your memory, you see. You know this is a, a huge piece by, it's like a symphony for piano. You must have played it. It's, it's very difficult and very exciting um, in three movements. Um, really, I must say, a problematic piece for, 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 not only for pianists, but also for analysis. And um, one thing which uh, comes here on level S1, aesthetics, namely that um, how seriously uh, performer has to take into account the, the, this, this program, which is written here, this quotation by Friedrich Schlegel, and anything uh, linked uh, in romantic uh, literary um, philosophical culture. So how much performer must know 
this uh, li literary, literary background in order to perform it authentically. That's a very big problem in, let's say, musical education. It's a problem because, you know, music is always unpredictable. Some musician can grasp these philosophical, metaphysical meanings without having any idea of, of what Schlegel wrote or, or what Hegel or whatsoever, uh, instinctively, intuitively. It, it's, it's a mystery how it happens, but it's the truth. But let's say, if you plan musical education, of course, you have to uh, uh, note that musicians should know something about literature. Now, um, you, you see here is a poem by Jun Alde Fjöne Fjöne in Bonten Deater Frau. I like that song, it's song in Fjöne and Heinrich Lauschet in German. If you can German, I translate it freely. So, through all the tones, sounds uh, in, in the bright dream of the earth, a silent tone to the one who listens to it secretly. So what is this analyzer tone, this, this silent tone, which is listened to secretly? It's, it's a very, very big problem. And, and some people think that it is uh, the descending fifth in the world, which was side of our leaf, let's say it appears in the You know this poetry is totally conceptual. You can never think it on stage. It's impossible. The same like Wagner's uh, Liebermann uh, and Goethe Liebermann is impossible. It's utopian artwork. The same is Goethe's Faust. It's utopian. But you can imagine that in absolute music, uh, Schumann could, in such moment, um, um, such moment, um, somehow instinctively portray. Oh, this is be Ferruccio Busoni in his Entwurf einer Neuen Tonkunst. He wrote about that. Uh, some great composers in some moments when they are free from the straight jacket of the sonata form, then they 
they, they feel that this uh, Urkunst or, or Pankunst, which we said, and I think this is the moment of such. Uh, and I did this with this um, interpreter and Goethe's Faust number two, but of course I can't prove it. <laughs> I have no evidence in history that Schumann would have been thinking of this program uh, at Goethe's Faust, but I think. Uh, <laughs> If you are competent in romantic culture, uh, in this intertextual field, I think it, it is that, certainly. It's, at least it's program for me, myself, personally. But I can't prove it exactly, but it is there, so. Anyway, um, interesting thing in this uh, whole fantasy is certain that um, uh, you must know the history a little bit, the facts. Schumann wrote it, first version, 1834 uh, or five. And then it was called, uh, I think, Fantasy Stücken, and it had, had every moment had, had a program. First one was the ruins, the ruinen. Second one was the, the, the arch of a triumph, the Siegesbogen, arch of, of tri triumph. And the last moment was um, um, palm, palms, palm trees. Or other program was um, um, star constellation, stars. But then the publisher, Bradford Herkel, did not like these problems. They, they, they took it away altogether. <laughs> and the only thing which remained there was, in fact, in the first movement, this um, uh, side section in the Gendem Tom. That is here. Uh, that I have quoted this passage in my study, myth and music, as a typical example of the legendary scene in music. And, and you know this. Uh, Okay, and then uh, to move it so that you, you can see this is very exciting. 
this um, no This one you may remember. So, this is very, very interesting because this is the, the counterforce. This uh, music is all together stopping the whole energy. You cannot stop the music uh, even more because you get into. Um, uh, Category of fragment as a typically romantic expression form. And I think Charles Rosen is also uh, speaking about that. It, it is totally justified to see that whole Schumann fantasy is put, uh, put together of fragments simply. And it was a uh, very special um, textual device, uh, similar device for romantic. Uh, um, so so it's, um, it's altogether exciting. But then uh, uh, the, about these conflicts in this piece, um, I would say that. Um, uh, one major certainty is uh, whether this is sonata form or not. And this link with the idea of ruins, so if there are ruins, and by the way, Schumann repeated this idea of ruins, uh, he was very obstinate, and that there are some, what are these ruins? <laughs> well, I was thinking it might be the ruins of the sonata form, <laughs> because it's sonata form, it is a ruin, definitely. You should have exposition, development, well, where you have development? Is this development? When you have this in the game before. No, it cannot be. It's, uh, the the genital is only repeating this uh, same theme, like like um, like um, like a song. So it, it's not the development at all. I would say there's no development. Recapitulation is there? Well, a kind of, but but uh, totally truncated. And uh, because when you expect that you return to the beginning uh, after this in the game before. And then starts from on the much much later. So, it, um, so sonata form definitely is something in the mind, but it is ruined. Well, I remember I, I spoke this um, analysis uh, last spring in Wrocław uh, in the Congress in Poland, the uh, music analysis, and there was uh, my colleague from Vienna, Hartmut Krones, Krones, who is high specialist of the. <laughs> Uh, at, and he uh, argued against me that how can you say, speak about sonata form in Schumann because uh, sonata form came by A.B. Marx, uh, you know, the much later as canonized form. Schumann uh, didn't know about what such thing uh, exactly. <laughs> no, I answered that, well, certainly sonata form existed as an oral tradition of musicians because Mozart, Heim, Beethoven wrote in, uh, in sonata forms. Of course, albeit it didn't uh, exist as a canonized form, it, it was something in, in, the, in the mind of a, like a kind of structure of S2, S2 level structure, SUA2, in, in the mind of Meister composer, it could be. But of course, the sonata form, you know, Beethoven never, never um, wrote in sonata form, but he wrote with sonata form. That's Carl Dahlhaus said uh, almost that the Beethoven composed with sonata form, so every Beethoven sonata, they are different, certainly. There is no such thing by, like idea of sonata form at all. So anyway, um, uh, I'm studying this um, uh, Schumann. I'm sorry, I'm taking a bit too much time. Close, if I step over. Uh, but um, study is rather long, and I I go systematically through all these levels of M1, M2, 
Uh, and then at the end, I ask that are there existential tones in Schumann's fantasy? If you want to see that, just the final conclusion, then I, I conclude. So let, let me go to the last page. That's something to be shown here. Uh, ah, there is also, there are two thematic analyses of the piece by Marston and um, some other gentlemen, so it's I quote, but they repeat the same as I said, namely that all these two motives groups this. Well, of course, famous is this direct quotation of um, Andi Therne Geliebte by Beethoven, you know, the, the da -di -da -di -da -di, that, that, that is, the, of course, taken from Beethoven directly. That is one totally evident uh, uh, semantic, uh, you don't know this, but even this quotation is so well written in the Zatz that, that it is anticipated so much that uh, you don't feel it as any quotation any longer. It's, it's a part of Schumann texture, definitely. You know, you know, if you, you know, this should be that at the end of the, the first moment, then the closes in the, in the um, state of being in a very, very har harmonious and wonderful. Um, um, you know this but certainly the, the listeners of Schumann time knew it it's it better off and certainly they recognized it. But but um, but it is so. So certainly that is something something semantic. I would say it's not only semantic, but it is semantic because it's better than the Tenegrite. It has a certain text and it has certain fixed meanings. But um, I go to the end of the uh, other existential uh, notes in. Oops. You see. Yes, here it is. Existential tones of fantasy. I have touched this problem of existential tones in another study by Mozart, in my study of Mozart D minor fantasy analysis, where I have discovered one existential tone. <laughs> but read my text, I tell you what it is. Let me um, uh, see it. Wait a ah, it's possible. Like um, namely, um, I have not uh, spoken at, at all here about. Um, one very important category in my new theory of semantism is the, the transcendence, which, which is something which you don't find in any, any dictionary or encyclopedia of semiotics, certainly. Uh, my British colleague once shouted to me in Congress that I hate, trans I hate transcendence, <laughs> so he didn't like to have because semiotics, of course, is very empirical science, very, we are studied very empirically. Uh, and my whole model, this jet model, is totally empirical, these four cases, M1, M2, we are in the Dasein, Dasein level. But at any time, we can make a transcendental journey or act, we, we can leave this and we can see uh, this process in the light of transcendence. And that is very, very important in my theory. And so um, we might ask here, uh, like, oops, like, it's here, maybe, mm, no, how can I move it from there? You want to go down? Yes, uh, I see the whole pulp. No, this way, this right. Oh, yes, indeed, so that we are in the middle. Thanks a lot, okay. So um, we might ask, can you see? I think I read, uh, uh, what are such moments dense with transcendental meanings which would characterize themselves as something existential? Because such moment is existential in which we transcend the, the Dasein, the reality. Maybe the transformation of the main first theme, descending scale from A to D, into its transcendental sign quite at the end of the third movement. Maybe the whole atemporal nature of the last movement and the reminiscences of previous passionate actants who have lost their character as real and becoming something ideal. Maybe the reaching of the C major tonic at the coda of the first movement, which I played, at the same time when Beethoven's Andy Fernege Liebt, the motif appears as a transcendental actor, indeed, since it originates from outside of the whole work as a true exo sign, but which in fact was already many times anticipated earlier. 
Uh, thanks to these preparations on the level M2, albeit hidden, this motif, when it bursts out, is also a general sign, okay? Or is the existential um, due to the clash of levels, say, sonata form, S2, and the real actors, M2, manifesting via the rhetoric figure of ellipsis. By the way, it was figure of ellipsis that you delete something and, uh, and then suppose that the uh, listeners uh, understand it. That ellipsis, you know, that such figure. All right. Or is it the, is the alternation of melodious and actorial singing of the moi and abjected repeated chorus in the last moment, which I played? Uh, okay. You went too far, maybe. Okay, maybe. Yes. Oh. Or is it? Um, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> or in the extreme? In the extreme. Ah, uh -huh, should be. No, I'm sorry. I should maybe next page, I suppose. Yes. Here, Seginti. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops. No. Okay, I, I conclude because I'm. Okay, thanks. Just the last. Or a, or this Tristan chord, uh, or just the transcendental in the Schlegelian Kantian strive and drive toward the transcendence. Okay. Fragment. Therefore, we, we very much remain in the search for a lyser tone, which is nothing but also an existential tone in the bright dream of the earth. So, thank you. That was the end of my piece. Thank you. Questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned Wagner changing Oh, yes, yes, yes. And um, I agree with you that tempo is everything and tempo holds peace together. And, yes. and tempo is the time we need to say things. Um, and although one might change interpretation every time, as Wagner did, there is, don't you think, there is an essence, an essence that remains even when you take like a, a one a Brahms third symphony and you see uh, performed by Bernstein, for instance, in a very slow way. And then, uh, you know, they are so different, all these interpretations, but there is an essence, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I, I agree ab absolutely there. Uh, so that it is not totally arbitrary, let's say, tempo, yeah. not at all. It is depending on many bits. So it depending on one hand on the text, musical text, what is written, what composer wrote there, and on the other hand on the performer. And he is very, uh, every performer has a different body, different physical mm -hmm. uh, kinetic, kinetic energy. And every person has his own tempo, which he must yeah. discover in, in this. So, and then I think these two things must uh, be put together, the, the time which is put in the text and then the time of the, of the performer. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it becomes semantic, let's say, was just one case I quoted, uh, namely, you know the Beethoven Seventh Symphony, the famous Allegretto. You no, know, this, this uh, you know, Seventh Symphony. Yes, okay, yes, okay, yeah. Beethoven. Okay, um, I recently heard it um, by some conductor playing it uh, rather fast, you know, very, pam, 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 very like that. But um, if we take seriously the German scholar Arnold Schering, who wrote this Beethoven und die Dichtung, who said that uh, <laughs> this uh, Allegretto of Beethoven portrays the funerals of Mignon from Goethe's uh, Wilhelm Meister. Mm -hmm. If you have that idea, then certainly it gives the idea of the tempo, that it, it cannot be too fast. Yeah. Of course, Allegretto, uh, well, Allegretto is rather fast, but not quite, but it, Allegretto is not Andante or, or, or Adage, but it's Allegretto. But, but anyway, it, it gives a character. So I mean that sometimes um, there is a whole romantic culture or culture in general behind certain tempo. So it must be like that. And if the interpreter makes it differently, then you see that's wrong somehow. Mm -hmm. This conductor was a very famous one, <laughs> by the way, but I felt it was wrong, the, the tempo, because I had in my mind this interpreter, this, uh, this minion funerals. Yes. So I mean, it's very complicated. Yes. Although, so, uh, although we can, we can, you know, we can deal with all these variables, there is yes. an essence that shouldn't be, you know, um, um, neglected. Yes. Otherwise, yes. It discharacterize the piece. If I, I yes, made, yes, tempo is I, very. I made up this word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but tempo is also like uh, very cultural. Let's say Villalobos. Let's say Villalobos. You can either have either extremely slow tempi 
or extremely fast. So, yes. so yes. it's it's very very typical of this composer. Uh -huh. So this extremity, and it's something cultural. Uh, I see, but maybe you Brazilians you don't see it in that, that way. But but um, hmm. okay. <laughs> Congratulations first for, for your for your speech. It was very good. I, I have a question. Basically, I'm thinking about the young students. Uh, so we, in general, we, we perfectly understand the importance of, of course, of having a strong and solid culture. You know, in order to understand how, how to perform and to interpret the music. Uh, still, I mean, for the young students, do you think it would be indispensable for them? Uh, I mean, this notion of semiotics, uh, I mean, how would you position, you know, for a young instrumentalist, I mean, in terms of his need, uh, ultimate need of semiotics or not, for <laughs> good performance in the Thank other. you. <laughs> it's very, very, very um, good, good question, very, very pertinent, very, very essential. So how, how semiotics could appear, because semiotics, you say so, it's something very, very <laughs> difficult, abstract, but could you think that you could, uh, use it in education, let's say. Uh, it's a good idea. Well, um, we must ask what is a semiotic view of music? A semiotic view of music that is that music is meaningful. It means something. It has sense. It is not like uh, Edward Hanslick put it. It's not Tönet bewegte formen. It is not only sound forms, only physical stimuli to the air. No, it, it, it has significations. And then certainly if you teach young children, I think their fantasy uh, can be much helped if you give, give all kinds of, let's say, programs or... or we have in Finland uh, in uh, violin playing the rather famous Hungarian school by, by Silvai brothers, maybe you have heard. They, they have their, in the Eastern Helsinki, they have their own um, youth orchestra, which is very famous, uh, very, very young, from I think youngest are uh, five years old, they play in the orchestra. And, and they have a system that they have so-called color strings. You imagine that every string has a certain color. And even maybe some animal like bear, <laughs> rabbit, uh, wolf, whatsoever. So that, uh, but by, I mean that by this kind of semantic categories, you can perhaps um, stimulate the fantasy. And then, then somehow then the children can get easier to the musical form also. My, my question has a lot to do with, because there is a kind of taboo when you speak in terms of music. I particularly don't think so. And I always when I'm working with, for instance, uh, with orchestras, be it professional or uh, student orchestras, I, I, I do not have any problem in making images. You know, let's try this to have this. But it, there is a strong taboo in music. Yes. Uh, for instance, when, when you try to do this kind of thing, like if music should be uh, sufficient by itself, not having to recur to extra, extra. There is, there is this taboo. Yes. I personally don't think yes, tabu. so. Certainly taboo due to the so-called famous uh, canon of Western classical music. So certainly established, which is, canon is mostly the, the so-called absolute music, let's say symphonies and so, and everything which is uh, alien to that, that, that absolute idea is somehow uh, dubious or uh, excluded, but, but it's, it's wrong because uh, even that absolute music is full of science and meanings. As it, so that, and when you perform, certainly uh, you, must, you can make your performance lively if you understand these contents. So that uh, I agree with you of this, this taboo issue. I have a question. Oh. Uh, I come from a, uh, another world from the jazz yes. and uh, popular music world. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I deal a lot with improvisation. And yes. you, you yes. spoke a little bit about that at yes. the beginning. And I find, uh, both as a performer and a, a researcher, that many of these improvisations are not simply spontaneous emanations mm -hmm. of yes. sound, but they also have a meaning, that there's a separate, mm -hmm. well, there's a rhetoric that comes from yes. each tradition of improvisation. Yes. And I wonder now that um, we're in the 21st century and we're teaching students who are yes. of this century how we might apply this theory to a new set of content. Yes, that's a very good question because certainly uh, we must not notice that this um, 
music is something um, quasi universal and that people come from many, many different cultures. So, that, so they come from other cultures who have no idea of those composers who live in, let's say, Mozart or Beethoven. They come really, but they want to perform it. They, they, they somehow, it's very important for them to know, like, like in China or whatsoever. So that, um, and certainly in just improvisation, uh, it's exciting that you say that you feel there is meaning behind that. that there is some kind of, uh, maybe it is totally uh, implicit meaning or to totally hidden, but, uh, but it is there somehow. But of course the pro problem is that whether we can make it explicit somehow to other persons. And if it's made an explicit model, then you can perhaps uh, even better uh, teach it to, to others if you have such uh, teaching. That's one of the purpose of semiotics is certainly to make these implicit intuitions explicit so that you can talk about them and that you could have a uh, meta-language uh, verbally where you can, in which you can uh, discuss these meanings. I'm not sure whether it's always successful, but uh, that is the goal of the whole musical semiotics altogether. Yes. Uh, I would like to yes. um, go back a little bit to the question that um, Isaac um, asked about the, the, this taboo of um, not, not associating um, imaginative um, instances to, yes. to, to the music. And I'm wondering uh, if you agree that if we stick to some kind of images that we pretend to be universal, maybe then there, there has to be a taboo and maybe we have to be careful. What yes. if we relate those images to our personal history as a way of connecting to the music as, as a performing artist? So that's, yes, I, I, would you agree with that? I, I absolutely agree. I have uh, that much play that I know that uh, uh, very often as a musician, everyone makes um, an own program. It is maybe totally naive, but, but it, it, it is very important to have it. Maybe this program later disappears when, when you master the piece, but, but, but you need it somehow. I think it's uh, psychologically very important to have, have such, such issues. You are right. Verbalized yes. or not verbalized, but it's important that each one of us knows how to connect to each specific piece at each specific moment of his life. Absolutely, because the, the process is that the, the, the musical text, which is uh, out of you, must become a part of yourself. It, it must, somehow you have to, must assume it. Mm -hmm. and, and then you need all these uh, uh, channels whereby it's it's possible, and so that is exactly that's that is exactly one. what yes. I was trying to. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's quite you've, true. Uh, <coughs> you've touched a very interesting subject because um, when you you uh, Terence mentioned emotion, which is another, it was a very complicated yes. subject because, as you said, Anna, instead of uh, of um, Trying to remain, fix, trying to fix, and that, that this is a study that if we've been seeing. That's perhaps a, a good um, a good um, theme for a third study today. Uh, it has to do with uh, with the cognition area, who studies emotions in music, and um, by what um, I like to, I agree with you. Um, you have musical emotions that's what you feel musical emotions yeah. and when you f when you can name some of them is because you associated that particular material sound material with a, a personal experience and then we will have a, some, some some kind of emotion that you can explain but it's very personal and it's very yes. uh, what I, I feel is that uh, the when you try to to uh, to standardize, like uh, this kind of musical material provokes uh, a, a happiness, for instance. It doesn't, because the same material mm -hmm. that provokes happiness can provokes uh, anxiety or, or, mm -hmm. or a feeling of uh, thrilling or something yes. like that, because the material is the same. So I agree with you, and I would like to, you know, uh, to to go further in a, like a third study day uh, around this kind of, uh, you know, the, the meaning of the meaning of emotions, the emotions in music, and I, I know that lots of things have been written about it, but uh, for for the, yes. the the professional musician, you never see you never see a, pro a professional music, musician telling you when I play this passage, this passage, I feel happy. 
Yes, so, yes. don't you agree? It's a very, you know, it's a very large um, um, domain, yes. and uh, it's difficult to try to standardize these yes. ideas, these notions. And I agree absolutely. <laughs> it's fascinating this emotional aspect because, well, I have one student in Helsinki just now studying the the emotions of pianists and how how uh, should they be in a certain emotional state to transmit that to the audience. Well, this is also a theoretical problem because Susan Langer, you know, Langer wrote yeah. a long time ago that, that uh, musical meaning is never symptom uh, symptomatic. You, you could contaminate, let's say, your emotion <laughs> to the others. It's not uh, because the emotional state really in your mind on stage can be totally different from the one you, you, <laughs> you are making by music. Yes. Yes. You can hate the audience. You can, you can really think that this is terrible. You can be totally scared, but uh, nothing of that is seen or heard. Yeah. It's totally a other thing which, which is shown to others. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, um, it's this fierce <laughs> side of what he gets so being to others. So that, but that's very, and then sometimes emotions, they are also part of the culture, like, like uh, Baroque music, the affect and layer, so they, they, are, they are canonized to form certain forms of mm -hmm. emotion, which, which you must know to interpret simply, to make certain um, things on the interpretation. So. Uh -huh. But, uh, but of course, music, music is very <laughs> personal and very subjective, as you said, yeah. and, and emotional in that sense.